on to the next slide here, and we'll talk about putting together the normally open uh, versus normally closed configurations. Uh, and this can be a little bit confusing, but so we're just going to uh, step through a little bit at, at a time to see how this operates. Uh, the application engineer that's actually piecing this together uh, is designing this to be able to say what happens and what's the best way for this valve to fail if the air pressure in the system uh, is, is lost in the building. So in this particular case, uh, we're talking about a normally open valve, and this is application here is the, both the, is the assembly. The assembly of this actuator with the uh, bladder and air pressure coming on top of the bladder uh, for the air I'm drawing back and forth in, and then pushing down when the air pressure comes in and starts to build up pressure, and then the uh, my air, my arrow is a little bit slow right now. I'm not really sure why. Uh, bear with me here for a second. There it goes. Uh, and then this then extends down as the air pressure starts to build up above the the bladder and pushes this plug, and the plug then seats on this particular side of the valve and closes and does not allow the, the water to flow through. So the water that would be going from left to right here would be stopped. In the same situation, we also have a normally open uh, configuration uh, by putting a reverse acting actuator uh, with the bladder and air pressure coming underneath the bladder, pulling up and pushing down with that spring uh, with a reverse acting uh, valve. So when you piece these two together, a reverse acting uh, uh, actuator along with a reverse acting valve, you do get a normally open uh, valve configuration allowing water to come from left to right through here. Now, uh, John, you had pointed out uh, before in our practice session that this plug is really in the direction of the water flow is not really accurate, is it? Right. Uh, generally, what you will see is the arrow on the side of any valve body that points along with the flow. And uh, if there's ever a doubt, the water should be going against the plug. So in other words, it, in this picture, the arrow should be flopped. So flow would enter from the right, go toward the left, down against the plug, and out the left. So it's just something you'll see if it's backwards, if it's installed backwards, you will find that as the plug approaches the seat, it will slam, and the valve will start to hammer and make all sorts of racket. And you'll lose your ability for smooth modulating control. So let's take a look then uh, at the normally closed configuration. Again, the configuration being the combination of the valve and the actuator together. That this, uh, in this particular case, we have a direct acting uh, valve, and so the port and this is down. Plug is sitting on the seat, and now if the air pressure comes underneath this bladder, it's going to stretch the spring, pull up on the stem, and allow water to go through. But if this was just sitting. Uh, in the pipe, and there was no air pressure, the whole system did not have any air pressure available, this valve would sit and be closed uh, and be so therefore normally closed, no air pressure. In the same situation here, we, again, we have a reverse acting uh, valve with a direct acting, so they're opposite. And so this water flow that's coming through here uh, would be stopped without air pressure. You need air pressure on top of the bladder to be able to push down on this stem and therefore open this plug up to the seat and allow water to flow through on this valve and actuator combination. So the, one of the benefits that we talked about before is not only are these valves inherently modulating, but they're very simple to predict their fail position. As opposed to electrics, where you're familiar, you have to have a spring return feature added. OK, so let's advance the slides. OK, so we're getting in a little bit more detail here on spring range. The springs in many actuators are color-coded based on the spring range themselves. Here we see an example of a 4 to an 11 pound spring. And essentially what that means is that 4 pounds, the spring will be completely extended. The valve, in this case being a normally open valve, will be fully open. And as we apply a pressure to the top side of the diaphragm, there will be no downward movement until we hit roughly that 4 pound value. These are not exact. Uh, you might find a spring that'll start to move at three and a half or maybe four, four and a quarter, four and a half, but essentially the downward movement will begin at about four pounds. The other end of the span, the 11 pound value, tells us that the spring will be as compressed as it can be. The valve will be fully closed in this normally open valve case at about 11 pounds. So the beauty of the 
uh, valve spring range is that we can predict when the stroke will begin and predict essentially where the stroke will end. And that becomes important in our next slide where we look at an application, a very simple one, with an air handling unit. So we have the fan on the left-hand side blowing air through a heating coil and then through a cooling coil into the space. The space is equipped with a direct-acting thermostat. From your last session, you'll remember that as the temperature rises above set point, the branch pressure rises, meaning direct action. The normally open valve on the left for our heating is going to be open again in the absence of any air. The right-hand valve, our cooling valve being normally closed, will be closed in the absence of any air from the branch of the thermostat. So looking at the diagram on the top right, we're looking at set point being about eight pounds. As the space temperature falls, the branch pressure falls, and that valve begins to vent back through the thermostat. The stem rises, the valve opens, and supplies heat to the zone. As the temperature returns towards set point, the branch pressure from the thermostat rises, drives that normally open valve stem downward, reducing the amount of heat added to the space. If the temperature should begin to rise above set point, of course, the branch pressure will continue to rise, but now it will drive the normally closed cooling valve open in small increments. So you can see here that we will have a dead band between the heating and cooling valves, which is established based on the selection of the spring ranges, and that's why that's so important. When replacing an actuator, particular attention has to be paid to that so that you don't end up with overlap between heating or cooling. So that is typical in this application that a loss in air will give you full heat. That's just how you want your zone to fail. So this is that, that band mm -hmm. right there. Down at the bottom, okay. sure. Great. Okay, let me advance the slide. Mm -hmm. So close-off rating, or what's valve close-off as far as what the definition of valve close-off is. The, we're discussing a pneumatic actuator where we introduced the concept of you know the tight valve pulls off. A valve must be able to you know, stop the flow of water or steam when it's controlled and told to do so. A valve and actuator combination can be selected to close off tightly against the normally operating conditions, but does cannot leak if the water or steam pressure increases. So we have to make sure that the valve is not leaking and therefore have tight close off. We need to understand that the uh, fact that pumps may increase pressure at times and also to understand that water is not compressible, so head pressure can easily exceed a valve's close-off rating and push the disc or the plug off the seat and open the valve and let steam and water flow through. So this water or steam leakage can get excessive and even small amounts of leakage will cause a loss of control or wasted energy and certainly premature valve wear. Uh, leakage that is allowed to continue can cause the entire system to fail. So that uh, valve close-off is, is really important. And as you can kind of picture from that last example with the air handling unit where the valves were sequencing, picture in your mind, if you will, an actuator that doesn't have sufficient close-off to allow the steam valve to close. Just small amounts of heat will have to be removed by the cooling coil because, of course, the thermostat doesn't know if that's real space load or if that's artificial load introduced by the steam from the air handling unit itself. So it's very important. Great. 